and uh, uh, we can begin uh, today's discussion where uh, we we try okay to 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 join the execution of um, a react application on the client side <clears throat> with some uh, apis that are will be offered by uh, by a server okay uh, like we will learn <clears throat> sorry like we learned last week um, the first uh, ingredient that we need to make this work is a, a way a mechanism for uh, issuing um, an http call from uh, from within our uh, react application so basically uh, we in in our application we need in, a, in some way you know to access uh, the apis that we prepared in our server to access the data for loading data um, uh, uh, managing it uh, and so on and uh, in a way our uh, application must be able to send uh, http calls so http requests uh, to the api server okay and uh, in in modern javascript uh, uh, the mechanism for handling uh, these um, asynchronous uh, http requests uh, from javascript uh, is uh, the so-called fetch api hmm? In this, this call usually fetch API, but this API means uh, basically the, the, the JavaScript uh, library. Okay, so the JavaScript standard library library uh, offers uh, an API, uh, say um, implemented by the fetch function, and this is a, a mechanism that uh, uh, the browser offers. Okay, let's say let's be more specific in the browser. Uh, a, a mechanism that the browser offers to our JavaScript code to be able uh, to, to make these uh, asynchronous calls uh, to a, um, a remote server. So basically, what we have today is uh, uh, we we know how to create a, a React application started with the npm start. Uh, we have a lot of components, okay, and they live on their own, okay. So they 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 share the state, they update the state, and so on, but uh, right now we are able just to create standalone um, react applications then we learned how to implement uh, uh, api servers uh, with uh, http apis uh, in express basically so we are using express and the database and we are defining some routes uh, for the different apis okay this is what we learned last week um, today's question is uh, how can we know we know okay that these uh, um, APIs should be called by exchanging JSON data over an HTTP connection. Uh, our question is here, how can we uh, make these calls from our application? And this actually is a double question. Um, the first half of the question is uh, um, how actually to execute the HTTP call. So uh, what we can may do maybe on the command line with CURL or with wget with comments that issue HTTP requests. Um, we should do we should be able to do that those uh, from our JavaScript code. And so we have to learn this uh, fetch uh, mechanism, this fetch function that actually uh, handles this kind of uh, asynchronous call, of course, because I'm sending a request and then waiting for a response. So everything will be asynchronous as we are. Um, unfortunately now aware but the second ingredient uh, is not less important maybe is more complex is how to integrate uh, this data exchange into the life cycle of the react components because we learned that react components tend to be functional um, components that tend to be implemented by pure functions as much as possible and the pure function will only depend or the rendering of the function will only depend on its own parameters or its own state and already the state is it should be managed in a special way because it's outside the functional paradigm uh, and so we have special methods special hooks for for dealing with the state um, now it gets even worse because we are in some way <clears throat> exchanging information reading and writing information for, to and from an external server so this breaks the model of a functional dependencies in the components and it creates so-called side effects because some operation in, inside the component may affect something outside or some or in operation outside the component may in a way in some way affect the components uh, 
inside our application and so we need to learn how to manage in react this uh, um, double life first the main uh, operation flow is based on the states component properties and pure functions but uh, on top of this we need to be able to exchange information with uh, outside sources and this will be another part of, uh, of today's discussion basically we learn how to use this uh, use effect hook that is able to manage uh, side effects uh, inside the react components okay so when we have these two ingredients in place uh, we can put together the servers and let them work uh, in a in a in a complete application um, today we'll try to uh, learn the fundamentals and do some very simple examples and the next week will be for um, uh, uh, making uh, next week's class will be uh, devoted to to develop a, a larger exercise of the react scores uh, exercise that we have uh, where uh, we will see also some frequent patterns of programming so how to solve the frequent problems that come out uh, in trying to integrate these two words in react so basically we have this path uh, which is uh, two weeks long hmm, to go okay so let's get uh, uh, practical hmm? um first of all uh, we have uh, in uh, in javascript a method that is uh, implemented by the browsers basically was started by the browser developers um some of you maybe remember there was an, a, a, a very old uh, object called xml http request uh, which is now that was the starting point for doing all the all the um, client server asynchronous programming uh, now we are not using it we are using the, the modern version it's called fetch and is based on promises so fetch actually is a is a simple function that uh, uh, receives as a parameter uh, the url of the re of the resource that we want to uh, contact so we are inside the browser and we want to make an API call to a server. So we need to provide the URL of the server uh, that we want to contact. And uh, uh, of course, we can customize with the parameters of this function. We can customize the type uh, of request. So we can uh, issue a get or a post or a put or whatever HTTP request we want. And we can pass uh, uh, parameters to them. Um, uh, depending of course on the current value of this of the data that we want to send and fetch uh, starts the http request or basically schedules the beginning of the http request and this http request will take a long time of course um, because it needs to be sent to the server the server needs time to process it and to respond and the response the http response should have time to come back to the browser so uh, fetch uh, will only be able to return our a promise uh, sorry and this promise uh, will contain when the promise is resolved uh, will contain uh, the response the HTTP response so we have a JavaScript object that is called response that will contain all the information about the HTTP level response so the HTTP response is parsed um, we extract all the metadata, uh, all the body, and so on, and we have all of it uh, in, a, uh, in an object that is called uh, response. And so we can query the, uh, the different parts, <coughs> the different um, contents inside the response by analyzing this object that, I repeat, it will only be available when the fetch promise, when the promise returned by fetch will be resolved. Okay, so all of this will only be available. Uh, after then or after an await instruction uh, so that the promise uh, uh, should be completed so the basic uh, um, syntax uh, for for using this uh, uh, function is just uh, calling fetch and uh, providing the url that we want to call okay uh, of course this url should be mapped to a server where this route is defined and do and does something and returns something and by default, uh, uh, like we said, uh, it's use, it uses the get method. Okay, we'll see in a second how to use uh, other methods different from get with an optional parameter. Okay, so we are I'm issuing a get uh, operation on this URL, and uh, fetch returns a promise. So we have a dot then the then method waits uh, or will set up the callback that will be executed when the fetch. Uh, 
completes, when the promise completes. And the promise is completed when the uh, response uh, uh, comes back from the server. At this point, uh, we have uh, an object uh, a response, which is the, uh, the, the resolution value of the promise itself, uh, the value to which the promise was resolved to. And, and we can extract information from these response objects, uh, like for example, if there is some, if the body contains some JSON, we have a method for extracting the corresponding object and so on. <clears throat> um, and this, uh, this uh, we'll see in a, in a moment, uh, the, all the methods for extracting information from this response uh, generate responses uh, sorry um, from the response generate promises so actually these uh, uh, response to json will generate a promise which is uh, processed whose data is process, processed here okay since the initial response object is asynchronous it cannot deliver any synchronous result uh, um, so we have to chain uh, promises uh, first for getting the response uh, second for uh, getting the data that was contained inside the JSON of the response, but we'll, we'll come into details in a second. Uh, basically, we have a chain of different uh, um, uh, promises. The, the same, the exact same behavior, so they are totally equivalent. Uh, we can be done with the await instruction, of course, if we are inside an async function, um, where we issue the fetch. So the basic operation is the same, fetch, is called and it initiates, it starts an HTTP, an HTTP request. And all the rest is just the, the way we decide to manage uh, the response uh, or basically the promises that come back from, from this fetch operation. So we can do that with, with await. And so we have uh, um, um, an implicitly synchronous uh, uh, code. So this await will block until the fetch is resolved and will give me the response object. This response object here is uh, the same as this one okay so it's not the return value of the fetch but is the return value of the resolved promise itself because fetch will just return a promise if we await on the promise we'll get the the, the value and from this response we can extract the fields again uh, as we said before the different methods of response return promises so we must uh, synchronize them for getting the information so you can choose well, whether you prefer working with then and catch or whether you prefer working uh, with await and try catch. It's t totally up to you. It's just the basic mechanism of, of promises. So there's nothing, nothing new. The new thing is that this promise uh, will have to wait or, um, or we get information from a server uh, and not just uh, from the same browser that we are used to, um, to work on up to the moment. Okay, so we say that the promise return, sorry, the fetch returns a promise, and this promise will resolve uh, to a response. Hmm? So what are the methods that we can uh, extract from this uh, res uh, response object? Um, basically, we have, uh, and they may be useful in our code. Uh, one is uh, uh, an OK property, which is uh, sort of a pre-processing over the status of the response. So status is basically the HTTP status, 200, 200 for uh, success, uh, 304 for re redirect, 404 for, um, for not found, 500 for server error, and so on. Okay, that is the status code. Um, and we can query that and we, we can okay, decide what to do depending on the status that was returned. The OK value is just a Boolean value that is uh, true uh, if and only if the status uh, is in the 200 range, okay? So if, there is, um, if the server responded with the positive code, uh, normally it's a 200 OK or some variant of the 200 code. In this case, our response is uh, OK. So it means it contains the actual, um, a good, a valid response. In all the other cases, uh, OK will be false, and so we need in some way probably to process the error because there was some uh, some problem with the call okay so we can check the status directly or we can check the okay boolean flag to understand that we should check it <laughs> every time we call a, a promise uh, to be sure that the result uh, is correct and if the result is correct we can extract uh, actually 
the content uh, that is made of the headers uh, we can query the different headers of the response if we need or we can uh, analyze the body uh, of the response itself okay um, that can be uh, a return that can be read uh, usually the body will be analyzed in, in json format so that's why we use in the, the json method mm -hmm. so uh, basically from the response object if we want to try it uh, this response object as does the status property or, or which is maybe not found in this case okay will be false the status text uh, is the textual representation of the same uh, uh, status and if we need to extract some headers uh, we just use response.headers and we have this get uh, um, method for extracting each of them no? each, uh, each specific header so something uh, basic information about the the response that we just got uh, from the server so uh, if something goes wrong uh, the uh, what we find is that the OK is false, maybe false, or it may happen that the promise is rejected. So the strange thing is that uh, fetch behaves in a strange way. The promise is only rejected if the error is not at the HTTP level. So maybe it's uh, you have a network connection error, the server is not found, so we have a problem at the TCP IP level, at the connection level, and so on. Uh, the request goes in timeout and so on so in these cases uh, you have a rejected promise uh, so you have two processes in the catch branch mm. so uh, when there are some network errors uh, you need to catch and handle this kind of error but if the uh, http request completes and even if it completes uh, with a bad code the uh, promise is uh, fulfilled. So it will go into the dam branch of the promise itself. Okay. Uh, then inside the dam branch, you can examine the response and see that whether the uh, response is true or false. So usually you have uh, two levels to check. First of all, we call fetch and we wait for the promise uh, to resolve or to reject. If it's rejected, then it's a network error. If it's not rejected, uh, then the HTTP call went through, and we need to, uh, to check whether the HTTP status call is valid or not by checking uh, the OK flag. So, um, in the, uh, this is an example call for handling this situation uh, where uh, we have the uh, response. Uh, and we have later on the catch method. So we are issuing a fetch, will give us a promise. This promise may be rejected or fulfilled. If it's rejected, we go here. So the promise, re the promise is rejected. We, feel, uh, we fall down here and we handle this kind of error. We know that the error is at the at a lower level than HTTP. Now, something went wrong with the connection. Maybe the server is not running. Maybe it timed out. Uh, maybe the DNS uh, is not registered or whatever. And in in all the other cases, the promise uh, is fulfilled. We go into then promise fulfilled. We go into the then branch. And uh, we need to, we have, uh, at this point, we have, really have an, a response object, but this response may be, uh, may be okay or not, okay? If it's not okay, then we have some reason for it uh, in the status of the code. Maybe just the status text will tell us everything, or like we implemented last week in the API, we will have a body of the response. In the response body, we'll have an error object, an error message that will tell us what, what went wrong. And so uh, finally, if everything is OK, we can process the response, the real content of the response. So basically here we can, we, we know that something was uh, OK, and we can finally return this response and process it if you want. In this slide, we are doing an extra check about the content type, but in, in many cases, it's not uh, 
is not needed because we already know what kind of content type we are returning. Okay, so but remember we are always to two levels of errors. First level, network errors. Second level, HTTP or server errors in some way. And we and they, are, they need to be checked in different ways. Um, okay, this was for the, the basic hmm, behavior of, of fetch for getting just a single um, get URL with no parameters. If we want to do something more sophisticated or something different, uh, fetch uh, accept a second parameter, a second optional parameter, that is an object, okay? And uh, with the properties that we set on this object, we can customize the type of HTTP request that is made. Um, the main properties are here. Uh, when method is a property that specifies, okay, do we want a get, which is a default? Do we want a post? Uh, do we want a put? And so with the uh, method property of this object, we can customize the type of request. So, for example, we will have a sec as a second parameter, we create an object with method is a post. And in this case, we are creating a, a post request instead of a, of a get one. And the post request should have a, a body, most likely, uh, because we are posting something. And so we have a second uh, in this object, we need to set a second property, which is the body. Uh, that would be some uh, some text. Uh, probably will be the JSON, a stringify version uh, in JSON of some object uh, that we want to pass, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and in in the case when the body is uh, uh, JSON, we will probably uh, set also the content type header. So we need to set a property of the headers by specifying that the, that the, that the content type, so the type of the body, will be a JSON object. So in the case of a get, basically we have, we have nothing to do. In the case of a post, uh, we need to, uh, to provide uh, some more information so that fetch can compose the, the request for us, uh, the actual HTTP request for us. And so this is the complete form for, a, for an example of a post method. So we have uh, the method post. We have the body that contains an object to send, that we want to send to the server. And of course, we cannot send an object. We need to send a string. And we are using the stringify method for converting the object into a JSON string. And we need to tell that uh, uh, the content type is JSON. And for doing that, we need to set uh, one of the headers. So headers, you see, you have a nested object. We have the first level objects here. And since uh, headers may be more than one, headers on its turn is, a, is an object. So an object inside an object. And in, in this object, each property, each line, each different property is a, a different uh, a header that will be added to the request and will be sent uh, to, the, uh, to the server. So when we have a method uh, post, uh, usually we uh, we always have to to set these three uh, um, three properties. It create this uh, initial JSON object, method header, uh, headers and body, and that will complete the all the information that we need that the browser needs to to send a post request. And uh, apart from this, uh, the this is related to the composition of the request. So sending it, sending the request. Uh, processing the response is actually identical, OK? So uh, we may have a catch, we may have then a method for processing the response that we, can, that we get back uh, exactly as before, OK? So there are two different uh, moments. One is we are composing the request, and the other is we are processing uh, the response that came, that came back. Um, the the last part that we need to uh, to examine is how to uh, process the body of the response that we received, uh, because we know that the response has a body property. Hmm? But in the slide, I didn't I didn't uh, you know, uh, explain that very well because the, uh, it's 
a bit more complex the body property so the response dot body uh, sorry rest where are we okay we have the response uh, dot body property is not a string uh, we don't have a string uh, with the uh, with the full content of the um, of the body uh, basically because uh, uh, the body could be very large and so we don't want to have all of that in memory at once so that this body actually is a, is not a string it's a stream a stream that should be read in some way like you are reading from a file not from a string uh, from a streaming stream in general and um, so that would require some more complex uh, processing on our side but basically it can be simplified by using one, some of the predefined methods here that uh, consume all this stream and convert it to a string or to, a, uh, to an object. So if we know that this body contains some HTML text or some text otherwise, we can use the text method that will read the stream, the body stream, okay, up to the end of it and will construct a string where all the text of the response will be stored or if we know that the the body will contain a json object then we may call the json method okay that will uh, parse the whole stream so wait until the response is finished transferring all the bytes and it will create a, 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 a javascript object by parsing the the, the json content of the stream itself and this is also the reason why these methods uh, um, text and json return promises they are not synchronous methods they are asynchronous methods because they need to process the stream and wait until the stream comes to an end so it may take time in the case of large responses so in general all these methods that process the body uh, return promises because these methods need to process a stream that may come or arrive asynchronously across different blocks different chunks of information so basically fetch will start giving you the response in some cases before the full response is arrived in the cases when the body is very large so you can start do something doing something with the response uh, while the the full body is still uh, is still loading uh, see this is a, is a it's a useful feature but of course uh, we pay it off by having to wait for the resolution of a promise uh, whenever we really want to have uh, the full body the, the content of the full body mm -hmm. uh, so we practically never use a response to the body uh in our code uh, and we try we use uh, some utility method that will able to to process it for us okay and the two most used one are text and json and i would bet uh, that 99 percent of the cases uh, where our body will be in json because we don't want to to deal with strange text formatting mm -hmm. um, the other methods are available but uh, we, we tend not not to not to need them in the kind of applications we are we are developing um okay so that's uh, basically the 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 behavior of of, um, of the fetch method uh, of course if you have one fetch okay it's not a problem if you have more than one that maybe depend uh, uh, um, one uh, one depends uh, on the on the previous one uh, each fetch maybe may depend on the previous one we should just remember that this is a synchronous code so uh, for example we have to wait uh, for the first for example in this example we are trying to get the list of users from an api and uh, pick the first user and get all the details uh, about this user okay this, this specific first user that we have uh, in the table and of course before being able to get uh, the information about the users we need to wait uh, uh, so I used to hear the, the await syntax instead of the then, but it's the same logic. Uh, we have to wait uh, until the first uh, fetch is uh, completed, so the promise is resolved, and the body is processed. So, so also the second promise from JSON is resolved. At this point, we can 
this way this fetch is closed it's finished and we can uh, run a second one if it depends uh, on the results of the previous one so we may have uh, fetches in sequence one after the other when and in the next one the second one depends on the results of the first one just don't assume that since you already wrote fetch you already have the result no the result will come much later await will help you in stopping and in staging synchronously the different operations um, in the case when you are trying to fetch or read multiple data that are not related to each other they're not dependent from each other you may also decide to run the promises in parallel run the fetches in parallel there's nothing new here we already knew when we studied the promises that there's we have a method promise.all that takes an array of promises and uh, uh, run, runs all of them in parallel and waits for all of them to complete uh, before uh, processing the result before giving us before resolving okay the composite pro the composite process so if we are trying to make more things run in parallel just remember that in this case uh, the different promises must be independent they should not rely on each other's results uh, um, and because we we never know in which order they will be processed okay um, but it's just uh, you know uh, basic uh, um, properties of, of the promises that are just applied in this special case to, to a fetch operation um, fetch is the basic uh, operation that is implemented uh, directly by the browser by all uh, current browsers uh somebody finds it limited because maybe you know creating a post is a bit complex because you need to pass the object and so on um there's also there's also some other mechanisms that we didn't uh, mention here like uh, interacting being able to interrupt a fetch when it's no longer needed okay what happens when you issue a fetch and we, that will take maybe you know 200 milliseconds and then you realize that you don't need the data anymore because maybe the user has already changed some parameters so you need a, a different query okay so it would be nice to be able to interrupt the previous one it can be done with fetch but it's a bit complex because we need to create an object which is called the abort controller and so on and uh, um, there are libraries that makes things uh, um, simpler so if one wants to have a simpler way fetch is already extremely simple basically if you want to have a simpler way, uh, a lot of people are using a library which is called Ax Axios, which is very um, um, similar. So I thought I, I, I don't have the example here, so I, 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 I thought I have an example in the next slide. But uh, uh, basically, it's a bit, uh, a bit, a bit simpler to do complex, complex stuff. For the kind of application we are doing, probably the, the basic fetch is, uh, is, is more than sufficient um marco is asking uh, what happens basically if uh, um if a, if a fetch times out or if a get request times out um this is a falls into the network problems uh, because actually the browser opens an http connection and the http connection will time out okay and uh, at that point when the http connection times out the, the http protocol doesn't have any timeout concept okay once you issue a request uh, http doesn't specify any timing okay but the underlying tcpip does so if they in the tcpip connection there is no traffic for a while then um, the connection is closed or the browser itself may decide to close it okay because it thinks it's dead and so it will time out the browser usually tends to close it after 30 seconds which is much sooner than the, the lifetime of, uh, of an idle, uh, an idle tcp ap connection that will uh, uh, fall into the network problems okay so you will not have a response of course and uh, you will have um, a rejected promise so a timeouts will be if we need to handle timeouts they will be they need to be cached here and uh, uh, we 
this is also may 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 become a problem uh, in because in some cases we forget to close the the response in the in this in the in the server. Hmm? So in that case, the fetch remains hanging, and later on the promise will be rejected. And if we forget the special case, we will have a rejected promise that we totally forgot about because now our our code is doing something different. Uh, remind me that uh, we will show an example when we do the, the real live coding uh, in the second hour. Uh, I, I'll try to remember to show you this kind of errors. Uh, if I don't, please remind me, okay? Because it's a, it's a, it's a frequent error, in, especially in the case of posts, when we don't have a real response to come back, so we, te we tend to re forget to give a re any response, okay? Okay, this, uh, um, that's all basically about the fetch function. We, we cannot show um, any examples right now, hmm? or we could, but it will be complex, uh, um, because we would need to run a, a React application or a Java, any JavaScript application, and inside that run, run some JavaScript that fetches a server. Uh, but there's a problem uh, uh, with a security security problem or the, um, uh, security limitation where um, the JavaScript in an HTML page cannot do any fetch to a browser, uh, sorry, to a server that is different from the server where the JavaScript originated. So it's not possible for me to just load a, a JavaScript, uh, uh, an HTML page with JavaScript from local local disk from my local disk and uh, make a, um, a fetch to another server uh, because it I will be blocked by the browser for security issues so if my JavaScript comes from server a then that JavaScript code can do some fetches only to server a except uh, some special exception that need to be set up so uh, it's probably faster to see how to solve this problem and then do the examples all together Okay, because uh, putting together something, we will we'll see the solution itself. And it comes uh, directly in the next slides. So I will have to wait uh, for for a bit uh, before showing you some, some real examples. And part of the solution is in this uh, second topic for today that we call the client server interaction in React. Okay, um, we, we understood that fetch is the way of making HTTP connections. We will see how to integrate in the, in the third topic for today, how to integrate them into uh, React components. But first we need to solve a, um, a server issue, a very technical server problem. Uh, the problem that we are analyzing now has uh, three different possible solutions. Uh, we will spend time together only on the first one, which is the solution which is the faster to implement uh, for uh, development purposes. And uh, if you want to know about uh, uh, other solutions, uh, which are more uh, for uh, calling to external servers, which are not our own API server, or for deploying your application into an external server. Um, you know, we will have the slides in there. If you want, you can read them, but they are not needed okay, for the development that we have in this course. They, they can be needed if you want to develop with some uh, server that can be called from a different application. So whether the React application runs on a different, totally different computer from your API server that we here we have you have the information that you need but it's not this this final part of the slides is not part uh, of the topics of the course okay we don't need it uh, but what is this two servers problems huh? what, what is the problem so let's reason a bit about uh, the architecture um, we have uh, our um, in the browser, we have our React components, and then we learn that in some way, React components can do some fetch calls to call some remote API, okay, for getting the data, for storing a new data item, and so on. Okay, uh, that, 
just remember that this React application doesn't uh, uh, is, is not born in the browser. It just comes from the server. So when we are doing some npm start, we are running a server, an HTTP server, of course, which is the uh, React development server in our case. It's a special. It's not Express. It's a special server. It's called the React development server. That, of course, uh, will uh, serve our requests. Basically, it's a stupid server. It's not very complex. It doesn't do because it basically returns the index.js uh, file plus all the uh, app.js, uh, the various com the various components, uh, forms.js, uh, or whatever. Okay, uh, and they will give them to the browser, and the browser will start to execute the application. After the initial loading of the application, then this server basically is idle. You know, it doesn't need to do anything more. But it's needed for creating the initial application. Uh, well, basically, it doesn't work exactly like this. If you go, if you see the, the network calls, so you see that all of these are bundled together. Uh, so this server, bundle, sorry, is R are bundled together the server is able to put together all the all the little files into a big file so that the the download will be faster uh, of the components so this this um, react server does basically the initial bundling uh, translating uh, translates the, the jsx and so on and finally delivers the file to these components so it appears that this javascript code comes from the server okay for now is uh, something like localhost uh, uh, 3000 okay then this react application will uh, okay this react development server is a closed server it's not something where you can develop your own routes uh, like we did with express right it does the job of maintaining the ecosystem of the React libraries. That's it. When we run our application, we need to call some APIs from an Express server, like we learned last week. And uh, uh, in this case, of course, uh, the, the fetch, as we learned, is able to make HTTP requests and send and receive JSON objects. OK, so far so good. This server is run with nodes uh, in our index.js or server.js and contains all the APIs. The problem now is, uh, uh, and this server is different, is distinct from the other one. Okay, it's not the same. And so it needs to run maybe on localhost on a different port, localhost, uh, I don't know, 3001, on a diff at least on a different port or on a different computer altogether but it cannot be the same server okay this one doesn't understand the jsx uh, doesn't understand how to package and to bundle the react components it only implements uh, the routes that we are programming no? the http apis that we have uh, developed so we have two servers which is this the so-called the two server problem the same browser page contains a JavaScript and receives a JavaScript from uh, the first server, like, uh, let's say, that runs on port 3000, and needs to, be make, uh, needs to make calls on port 3001 uh, that contains the API implementation. Okay? Uh, this would be nice, <laughs> except that by default, uh, for security reason, fetch can only or could only make calls uh, to the original server where this JavaScript came from. Came from uh, originally. Okay, we have a policy. It's called the same origin problem policy that limits uh, the JavaScript code only to contact, only to interact uh, with the same server where that JavaScript originally came from. And having a different port number or a different uh, server makes uh, a different origin. And so this call in, would be forbidden unless uh, we modify a bit the configuration of our servers. 
so this is the basic idea this is what we want to get right no? it's nothing um, it's the minimum that we need to have. We need the React development server in order to start the React application, at least in development mode, at least in development mode. In production mode, uh, it will be different. And we need uh, uh, a, a, a different API server where we implemented our routes and our APIs, get and post and uh, whatever. How can the two live together and be compatible with the same origin problem? There were as I mentioned before, sorry, I'm clicking on the right, on the wrong screen. Um, there were there are um, different uh, alternatives, different possible solutions. We will study the first one and we'll leave the the other two if you are interested. But uh, the big picture is that we have we need to have two servers. Okay, uh, the first solution that is good in development. Uh, is uh, to exploit uh, a, a feature of the React development server that internally contains a proxy functionality. So our React development server uh, already contains so that the one that we used with npm start npm start we started it and it delivered our application over localhost 3000. In our browser so we have all the components all the forms whatever some of these will make a fetch and we know that we are running an api server an express server on port 3001 but actually the fetch will be made on port 3000 the react application server will understand that this is is an api call and is not a call for the React components. So we will handle this request and repeat it at the lower level by, by changing the, the port number. So basically acting as a proxy. This server will process the request and the response will go back to the proxy that will deliver it back to the fetch API. So in a way, we have two servers but the browser only sees one of them, the one on port 3000. And it's the same that delivered the JavaScript, delivered the React application. And so we can safely make fetch requests, uh, fetch calls uh, onto that specific server. Some of these are just proxied and I uh, repeated back to a second server in a transparent way from the browser. So the browser thinks, you know, it is uh, calling, it is basically interacting with a single server on a single port that both uh, contains React components and uh, implements API calls. Okay, so this is the simplest way. Hmm? And it's very easy to configure and uh, it solves our problems uh, uh, basically in development mode. Hmm? Uh, the, it's not very efficient because every call needs to go through two different web servers. Uh, and all, uh, both of them are written in JavaScript, so they may be something slow. Uh, and we go through all the React scripts and so on. And first and second, in the in um, this modality is available in development mode. So while we are developing, it's okay. If we go want to go to production mode, build a production mode uh, um, version of our application, this trick uh, no longer works. Okay. Uh, the other two uh, solutions, I just mentioned them briefly, and there are the details on the slides if you are interested. Uh, one is uh, dealing with the fact uh, that we have uh, two different servers, and uh, the browser wants to make uh, queries on port 3000, of course, for the startup of the application, and also on port 3001. These uh, um, calls, uh, these fetches, would be uh, blocked unless the second server decides to accept them. So there is a standard uh, um, called course. Course stands from cross origins, whatever, cross origin request uh, something. 
so we are configuring the second server to accept cross-origin requests. So if we are setting some special headers uh, in our uh, in our server, uh, then the browser can negotiate with the server. Okay, I want to call an API even if you are not my origin server. Do you accept it? Yes, no, depending on a filter and so on. So with an extension of the of the of the server, the browser will be allowed to make also calls to this server. And of course, this extension should be careful because in this way we are opening the door to any other application to call our APIs who have visibility over our APIs. So this is the second solution, actually dealing with different servers and configuring the servers to accept this request from with a given set of constraints that are part of the configuration of the course in the server. Okay. The browsers is the modern browsers all understand how to negotiate with the server and to ask for permission for that. Okay. Basically, the price you have to pay is that the browser will make two calls instead of one. One is called the pre-flight. So I'm asking uh, the permission, and after I get the permission back, I will ask for the real uh, real content. Okay. This is basically, uh, by the way, is the mechanism that we are using with public APIs. If your application wants to call an API, I don't know, from Twitter or whatever, of course, that API server will need to be configured in this way in order to accept your request. Otherwise, it, would, it wouldn't be possible to integrate one application with APIs coming from different ecosystems. So that will be the second solution that works also with the public or external servers. The third solution is again uh, useful if you are trying to do deploy everything um, into a production server. So in this case, we have uh, a bigger ser uh, HTTP server, maybe Express, maybe another, maybe faster one and a faster solution or whatever. And where we have our routes that are implemented in React as we know it, plus the React application will not be run by the React application server. Okay. Uh, what we are doing here is uh, creating a bundle, bundle, let's call it bundle.js, which is one big file that contains uh, the whole application. And is call, uh, recalled by the uh, a different version of the index.html file. Okay. Um, these files will be totally static. So in this case, there are just files that are stored uh, and serve statically from our server. So we are uh, leaving the development mode, going into production mode. So all the components will be put together into a single file. Uh, all the debugging capabilities are uh, removed. All the JSX is converted once and for all into JavaScript and so on. And so that we have files that are just meant to be served statically and to be, of course, uh, implemented by the browser or interpreted by the browser. We'll read this bundle and uh, create our React application. Basically, JavaScript code is running on the, on the browser. Okay, But if we um, forget about all the nice uh, development capabilities like uh, reloading the application, debugging, and so on, everything is just uh, can be just saved, uh, like building an executable okay, of your code. And so in this case, these files can be just stored anywhere. Uh, we, we, you, must, you need to be careful with the URLs so that they can find information it needs. Uh, but they can be stored. So you package the, out the application, you build the application, you move the bundle into the production web server, and uh, the React application now can be served from the same server that contains your APIs. It will come all from the same server, this 3000, that now con is the main API server that also contains, by accident, some static files that are the core of the application. Okay, and and so in this case, you get rid all the, of the of the React application uh, server altogether, and you have only in production only the libraries that you really need 
for running the, the React application. As you see, the second and the third option are more geared towards uh, uh, production scenarios hmm? where you have the real servers and you have the real addresses in development mode they are overkill they need more configuration especially the third one you cannot just modify a javascript file hit save and uh, go to the browser you need to uh, save it uh, and rebuild and move the bundle and so on it's uh, it's uh, really uh, uncomfortable in development mode hmm? so that's why we are only uh, um, only going to to use the first uh, solution here uh, andrea is curious about which one of the second and third solution is used in the, in the real world um, depends of course uh, in the real world the react application server is never run on a public uh, on a public uh, server so the way to go would be probably the third one this one or where we are deploying maybe the, our server will not be express maybe it's uh, nginx uh, that is faster if we want and uh, with some uh, backend of the api that can be implemented in javascript or can be implemented in a different way so it will be more complex you need more uh, scalability um, or it can be a version of the second one where instead of react uh, we have uh, we have the bundle here so we are bundling uh, the application on one server and we are serving the apis uh, with cores uh, from another server so just to distribute the load uh, and have the because maybe this course uh, this api will also be used by, by, by the mobile application by some partners uh, that they, they need to call them and we need plus we need to have our own front end here but we don't want to run it on the npm start uh, command uh, and rather we bundle it into a real uh, web server which is will be faster so it's a matter of combining the, the different hmm. uh, the third one makes it difficult to modify the front end uh, yes uh, that's the purpose of it we are in production so in production you don't play with the front end okay this is the final version that you ship uh, to the um, hosting company where your website will be hosted that's fixed nobody's going to play with that if you need you need to recompile it, send a different, save a different bundle, and then redeploy it in, on the server. Hmm. Um, so when development development stops, uh, we have uh, the final version, and you don't need all the development packages anymore. So you minimize it and uh, just save it. You don't modify it there. You don't debug it there. Hmm. You only use it. OK. Uh, if we have time in the in the last lab of the course uh, after the second big lab expiration we have a lab uh, where we try to experiment some uh, deployment of, of the website on some uh, uh, public server like Heroku or some some server like that so that we will see how to migrate our our applications into a real web server hmm? as a last uh, lab in the course just for just for fun basically because it's not really requested by the course itself okay uh, so um, of these three solutions uh, the the one we choose for development is of course the development proxy which is uh, so this uh, the first column in our in our picture uh, it, we don't need to deal with cores uh, we don't need to bundle the application we just run it we run the, the two servers okay so uh, we need to npm start this one so npm start this one and uh, probably we run the node mon for the server .js and we uh, configure the proxy in the react application server by telling it to pass through this request and configuring it is really uh, one line one line of code in the packet.json of the react application server okay we are adding this line that's it then the next ap npm start then the react server will serve the react application and activate the proxy functionality it only works in development mode as we as we mentioned okay so it's not for production it's not for other environments but for development uh, um, it's just uh, as easy as changing one line of configuration so just very 
very quick. Just remember that it will only act as a proxy and the second server must be run. Okay, so we are still responsible for running one and two servers, for starting them. So first we need to start the, the API server, server, then we can start the React application and uh, it will automatically uh, activate also the proxy. Uh, how can this proxy know or understand whether a given HTTP request is intended, is meant for the React development server or needs to be proxied to the other server? Um, basically, uh, the React development server knows which are the assets that it owns. So it knows that we have an uh, app.js because it's in it's in its inside its folder inside the application folders so if you have a request for a static resource uh, or for an html file uh, uh, the js files of course are, are, are static or the style sheets or whatever inside the different folders then it will be the request will be uh, served by react by the react server Otherwise, in all the other cases, uh, it will try to send it to the proxy. So in any request that the uh, React server doesn't recognize, it will try to proxy it. Uh, so for example, if you have uh, API courses, it doesn't understand. It, it sees that API courses is not part of the asset in the in the in the public folder for example uh, of the react application so it doesn't know how to handle it and so we'll try to proxy it uh, to the address and there's a, a third uh, option is that the request is not recognized uh, the proxy does not respond does not respond doesn't find the resource it gives an error then the react application server will give you back uh, index.html so any other URL will give you back the full application, but basically the, the index.html that is used to reload the, 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 the application. So we are, if you are, just be careful, if you are linking to a, an, act, an address that doesn't exist, it will reload the application from start because it will serve index.html. It will return index.html and not a, a, an error. Okay, so this is a strange behavior also for uh, if you misspell some API address, it doesn't give you a 404 not found, but it gives you a copy of index.html. This is something that we should be careful about. Okay, uh, The behavior of these errors is different in this development mode rather than when you have a separate server. Um, so of course, uh, if we have, uh, uh, we know that some resources in the React application are under the root uh, index.html, for example. Some are under public, for example. Uh, so it's it's best for us if all the um, APIs are in inside the path that doesn't exist in React. Huh? And and normally, for example, we put them under API. And so it's easier for us to understand which URLs are intended to be proxied and which URLs are intended to be served by, by, by React. Um, and this is just for us, actually, for better understanding, but because the rules of, of the proxies are these three ones. Okay, If I recognize it, I will serve it. Otherwise, I will proxy it. And by default, uh, uh, you get the, the whole index, uh, and so you reload all the application. It's, the, the, the third one is a bit strange, but you know, in the JavaScript world, uh, there's a lot of uh, of, of developers that uh, expect uh, default behaviors that always work. Um, that's it. Uh, of course, the same logic of the proxy can also be used uh, with the other servers. Okay, but in that case, the configuration of the proxy is not uh, the same. It should be configured according to what uh, engines or Apache or whatever your server is, uh, if, if it allows you to, uh, to make a, um, uh, a proxy, to, to have a proxy functionality, you can use the same logic, of course, also in, in production with the different rules for filtering the APIs, filtering the addresses to decide uh, 
uh, which addresses go to React and which addresses go to the API server. So the, the idea is the same. Uh, the mistake that we could do here is the <laughs> forgetting to start the API server, and especially before launching the React application, as we will learn in, a, in the next uh, 20 minutes, uh, the Re your React application will probably have to load information from the server as soon as it starts, uh, before rendering the components, basically. And uh, this means that when we are starting the, the React application, the API server must already be running. You cannot start it later because otherwise the React application will give all sorts of errors because it doesn't find uh, the APIs. Um, and of course, uh, what we are doing in development it will be different from the from the URLs, from the type of errors that we have in production. So uh, we will need uh, say extra testing uh, uh, before going to production. But for development uh, is more than enough. Okay, so we'll stop here on this topic because basically the the the, the takeaway point is this line here. Is first this line and second we run two servers on two different ports. Okay, that's the practical uh, issue for us. And uh, okay, that's about the, the second topic for today. And these two are the it's a uh, background that we need to go to the real topic for today. So this was just a trick. And uh, the real topic for today is how to enable these React components uh, to uh, interact uh, with, the, um, with the rest, uh, uh, with the HTTP APIs. Okay, so now last week we learned how to make the APIs. Today we learned about fetch, which is a way of calling them. For fetch to succeed, we need to configure the proxy. Okay, now let's face uh, the life of components. And uh, how can we extend the behavior of a component, which is purely functional and reactive, as we learned, um, to be able to also to, to access um, a service. And for doing that, we need a, to understand a bit better the life cycle of a component. We already some, some have some basic idea about a component that when we are rendering in the HTML page in the DOM, if we are rendering a component, there's a moment when the component is inserted into the DOM for the first time. Okay, and the comp this operation is called the mounting of the component into the DOM. Uh, the component is there and uh, it's uh, implemented and we know that at mount time we are initial we are creating the state we are initializing the state for example use state uh, will set up the initial value and so on once the component is there we can change its its, its content its rendering by updating the props and by the, updating the state so the component may be re-rendered many times, basically when we are changing, we said props or state. The, the functional rules tell us that the component should only depend, the rendering of the component should only depend on props and state and nothing more. And context, which is a form of state, of course. Okay. The rendering and re-rendering of the component is totally in the hand of React. We don't know and we can control how many times a component is rendered. Uh, React may decide to skip some renders if there, are, if there are many changes that are happening in parallel. So, okay, well, I will only render the last one. Or we may decide to render the same component more than once because, because it wants, okay? The rule is, the contract is that you have to create the component, the rendering code of the component in a pure way, in a pure functional way, so that the number of times and the moments in time when the component is rendered should be, must be totally irrelevant. And so it should be controlled by React and not by you. This also means that you cannot control when things happen. React controls them. And of course, this is not acceptable if you're trying to make an API call. You want to know how many times this API will be done. 
and when okay so we need to step outside this functional view of automatic uh, updating um, by the way just a parenthesis uh, in the in development mode the number of renders is higher than in production mode because sometimes react renders a component twice just to, to check whether the two renderings are the same or not and if not it will issue a warning okay so in some cases you see more renders than you really expect that then the number of renders that would be that would be really needed just because react is doing extra checks to ensure that you are not uh, remembering some value that you shouldn't and so on okay so really we don't have the control over that Okay, the final state of the component is, of course, is when it's removed from the from the DOM. So when the component is not shown anymore because the render tree has changed, and so the component will have an unmounting phase. Okay, when the component is removed from the DOM. If the same component will appear again, it will be a different component and will be mounted a second time. So we mount a second instance. So after you unmount a component, unmounting is uh, is final, is definite. You cannot un-unmount, so go back to not unmounted. When it's unmounted, it will be destroyed. And so if you have another one, if you need to display it again, then it will be a different component. So it's a, a, a radically different operation to show a component, hide it, and show it again, because that will be a different component. It's totally different from showing a component and changing uh, changing its content or its rendering 27 times because there will be different updates on the same component. Maybe the visual aspect may be similar, but the life of the component uh, will be uh, different. So we, we need to be aware of this. Okay, and this is just the life of, of the component. So it's a bit more details about what we already knew about um, the rendering of the components. But we discuss this in more detail because we need now uh, to or uh, to see that uh, React gives us the opportunity of having special callbacks in special points of the life cycle of a, of a component. So we already know, for example, that uh, we can create a use state hook or a use context hook that are mentioned here. And we know that use state and the, the, the state and the context are updated every time the component is uh, is re-rendered, for example. Okay, when you are when you are updating a component, uh, uh, the state is is uh, re-evaluated and so on. Uh, we may also have some uh, uh, some other hooks, uh, and that we'll study now. In particular, the use effect hook. This is also called when the component mounts, when the component updates, and when the component unmounts with different rules. But first, we need to appreciate that React is doing basically two separate uh, steps uh, at every computation. The first step is the so-called render phase, which is our function, the execution of our function. So when we have a, comp a component uh, function C, the code that we have inside this function is the render code. When this, the React executes this code, it needs to be, it must be pure. It must not have any side effects. So the only thing that this function has are props, our state, and as an output, we have the render. Nothing more. In this phase, when we are executing this function, we must have a pure functional style. Okay? And can be so that React can call it as many times as it wants. Then, after we ret return the rendering tree, the JSX, then React will start later, when it wants, the so-called commit phase, when it takes the JSX tree and maps it to the DOM. 
in this phase uh, we are we are seeing uh, um, side effects because actually react is modifying something outside the state outside the props and this is basically the dom no it, which is an outside data structure but at this point uh, side effects uh, may happen so it's not forbidden it can be done and react of course does it internally and it also gives us the opportunity to add our own side effects uh, that we run will run in this phase okay so we must very clearly separate which code needs to be executed during the render phase and this code must be pure and functional like we did up to now and which code needs to uh, produce some side effects so uh, involve something that which is outside the component and maybe also outside the server like an api call and that should run in the commit phase so outside the body of the function and the use effect is a hook that allows us to define some callbacks that will be executed in this uh, in this context okay so right now um, we work the, always inside this phase in the design of our components uh, the state uh, and we were in the functional phase okay uh, right and from today we are starting to interact with the server and so we realize that we need to write some code also which is non-functional not pure and for that reason needs to be executed in a very controlled way through this uh, special hook uh, which is called use effect uh, which is the the goal for for today okay um i mentioned many times uh, side effects uh, in the previous slides uh, and also in the, in the in the discussion uh what are these side effects a, a side effect uh, is any computation any instruction that uh, doesn't uh, contribute to computing the output and the output is of course the jsx of the component the rendering the render tree and or anything that uh, so it affects something which is outside uh, the scope of the function component okay so if, if you are reading some information from outside the function if you are writing some information to some value outside the function then this is a side effect uh, and makes uh, that code uh, which no longer functional of course um, of course we don't use uh, 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 how to say global variables in in our programs because we are not crazy enough to do that and so outside the scope of the function what can it mean outside the scope of the function could be the browser so for example the window object uh, and so this means for example console.log uh, technically is a side effect because it, it affects something outside the function or i don't know window.title we can change the title of the window and this will change some information which is not controlled by a react component because it's something a resource that is directly provided by the by the browser itself so it's a, an outside resource also the, it's the browser um, provided uh, resources or uh, they may be fetches where we are reading or writing information from something which is very very outside the function it's outside even our server outside our computer or whatever so all these operations are are defined as uh, side effects and they are used uh, basically for data fetching for saving a log so with console the log or sending to a log server which is the more you know uh, production ready solution uh subscribing to something so um, maybe you are subscribe subscribing to a stream of events uh, you are opening a web socket something that we are not doing in this course but uh, you can when the application runs it will attach to a given set of resources to be updated and these updates of course come from outside the application and so it, all of these um, operations needs to be we need to be aware that they are in the broad category called side effects and whenever we are talking about the side effect it will it must be pulled out of the render cycle 
because it will not work if it's inside the, the render cycle because we will never be able to control when it's, when it will be executed or if it will be executed at all okay uh, if you are uh, scheduling some additional action so for example you are setting a timeout uh, or uh, with a set timeout uh, or set interval you are using a, an external resource which is outside the normal render cycle of the component okay uh, manually changing the dom so working with uncontrolled dom components is something that i would not like to do hmm? okay but in some cases maybe it's necessary or whatever so uh, i'm not saying that all of these are forbidden uh, basically, all of these features are needed, are required in a real application. But we must be aware they are side effects and therefore they cannot be in the render phase. They must be implemented in the commit phase inside some controlled side effect callback. Okay, so that's our goal. Uh, understanding that the, we, some operations need to let's say have a, a life cycle which is more complex than what the functional style of react requires and so uh, they need to be um, implemented separately and also we need to think of them separately uh, we have one flow of operation is uh, component rendering component props state uh, re-render okay all of the of this life cycle this one stuff and the other are side effect logic that w work on a more event-based uh, uh, let's say behavior the, according to some external events or some, some external when the fetch response responding the fetch so that the, the response of effect is totally not under control by react because we don't know when the when the server will respond and so they are they have a totally separate life cycle okay we should really design one and the other separately and then identify the points when the two match okay let's not try to do everything together okay so um, and we'll uh, we'll try to understand in the examples uh, of course uh, what this uh, let's say abstract sentence means in practice hmm? uh, okay so these are just uh, a summary no side effects in the render phase uh, and they only can be implemented in the commit phase so we identify which are side effects we run them and will be they will be applied after the rendering and after the dom updating so they will be in our code they will be after the return statement so we know we know that our component will return the jsx after this return the react will do some work and then possibly execute our uh, side effects code okay so this brings us finally to uh, to the hook that uh, will be the enabler enabler of this uh, kind of behavior and that uh, uh, where we will actually put everything together okay so uh, everything that we've been discussing since this morning uh, will convert now with this user effect hook uh today we'll just see the basic uh, behavior so learn how how it works with simple examples and uh, uh, next time we'll uh, try to uh, translate uh, the, this basic behavior into use cases that are more useful in the um, in, in larger applications okay so before diving into this i think we are we already have a lot of uh, say theory in our minds in the in this morning so i would take the chance of uh, having a break right now it's a bit sooner than usual, but uh, you will not be uh, you will not be sad for breaking a bit uh, earlier, I think, and uh, and so that we can start uh, with the use effect and in parallel develop some example to see how it works uh, um, in our React application. Uh, if you want to start, if you want to in the meanwhile to to fork and clone the the project that we I shared uh, yesterday on week ten, we have three in this project. There are three. What is that three folders one is called examples that we'll use it for for simple examples to, while explaining the slides and uh, uh, the other two are a, a small client server application for seeing how to use uh, effects uh, in the fetch now with the fetch uh, api 
um, I say just clone the project and in the break uh, uh, run the npm install on these three folders because it takes time because the, the examples and the client are React application so you need to download all the node modules and stuff so while you're taking a coffee let your computer install uh, all these three folders so that we can work together in the, in the second hour okay so if uh, there are no questions uh, i would uh, suspend it make a little break until 10:15. Uh, okay okay see you later <laughs>